Hello and welcome everyone to another Sales Hacker webinar. Thank you for lending us your eardrums and eyeballs for the next hour or so. Uh, my name is Scott Barker, Head of Partnerships and Revenue at Sales Hacker and Evangelist at Outreach.io. And I'm lucky enough to be moderating this discussion today. And I know we all lead incredibly busy, complex lives. So thank you for taking the time to sharpen the saw with us today. And you won't be disappointed. We have some amazing minds that have come together. And over the last few years, I've interviewed literally hundreds of execs from some of the fastest growing companies on, on planet Earth. And over the past few months, I've been having these discussions and really two issues seem to be coming up again and again. And those issues are number one, revenue team alignment, and then the second being diversity and inclusion. So we decided at Sales Hacker to bring together three top execs um, and try and tackle these problems um, in a round table kind of environment. And today we're gonna be starting with alignment. So that first piece is revenue team alignment. It's a monster topic to try and get through, but we're gonna do our best and we're gonna rely on you, uh, the community, to help kind of drive this conversation forward as well. Um, but before I introduce my three awesome guests, super quick housekeeping. So if you've ever joined a Sales Hacker webinar before, these are all recorded. So we'll send this out to you. Typically it takes about 24 hours for us to turn it around. Um, I will get emails saying, where's the recording? Where's the recording? Please save my inbox. It's coming, I promise. Um, and then the second piece is, like I mentioned, we do these webinars very much for the community. So if you're having very specific tactical alignment problems, jump onto the Q&A section. There's a Q&A section, put your name, your title, the company you work for, and ask away because we do really want you driving this discussion forward. But without further ado, uh, we've got all that out of the way, and I want to introduce uh, my guests. Uh, I am joined by Anna Baird, the COO of Outreach. Anna, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here today. Excited to have you. Um, and just going down in line, uh, joined with uh, Patrick Morrissey, uh, CMO at Altify. Patrick, welcome to the community. And you may be on mute there, Patrick. Yeah, I think it may be on mute. We'll get back to you, but we're, we're happy to have you. And then last but not least, uh, we have Nadia Rashid. Nadia is the VP of Sales over at Seismic. Uh, Nadia, welcome. Thank you, Scott. Excited to be here. We're very excited to have you. And, and Nadia is doing this on the road uh, like, like any good executive would be doing. I'm sure you're in an airport or something. Um, so unfortunately, we won't have uh, the camera on, uh, but we'll still get to, to steal all of her, her insights. So I really want to thank the three of you for, for taking the time. I know you all lead extremely busy lives. Um, but I think the best way to kick it off, we did really quick intros, but I think it's always great for the community to just get a little bit more of a background. So uh, if we can just go around and we'll go in the same order and, and I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, a little bit of background um, on your career, how you got to outreach and maybe a fun fact. Okay. Um... I've been in Silicon Valley for 25 years. I'm actually in Seattle today, but I, I live in California. Been in Silicon Valley for 25 years. I'm a tech girl. Grew up and, and born and raised in, in the, the professional world any, anyway from a Silicon Valley perspective. Um, spent most of my career at software companies, but I was a partner at KPMG. I was the global lead partner for Google pre-IPO for the next seven years, doing all the consulting projects to help them figure out how they scale and grow globally and not break. Uh, the same for Intuit and several others. 
I then went on to became a senior vice president at McAfee and we sold that company to Intel. And then I decided I wanted to go do startups and really to focus on how do you build the foundation to build that multi-billion dollar company so that you are just crazy successful. And so that is what drew me to outreach, which I love, have been here over a year and a half. Team is fantastic. Um, we, we do it better than, than a lot do with the growth rate that we've had. And it's been so fun to be a part of that. Um, and I am, as you noted, the COO on a big chunk of the organization. And we can talk about that later. But um, fun fact is um, I just was in Hawaii, which is not the fun fact. Um, but I, for the second time, um, was skydiving in Hawaii. And I oh, have to cool. the best the best skydiving ever is over an island that's in the tropics. So if you're going to go skydiving, don't do it anywhere except on an island in the tropics because the view is amazing from 13,000 feet. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. I've actually never been skydiving. I, I feel like a pretty adventurous guy, I would say, and I've never done that yet. So it's a good piece of advice. I can imagine because you'd like see this little speck of an island and it would just get like yeah. bigger and bigger. That's cool. Um, not, not yet. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, same question on to you. Perfect. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, I am the VP of sales at Seismic. So I've been here for about a little bit shy of 90 days and I'm responsible for overseeing the East Coast sales teams here. Uh, prior to this, I was at Marketo and a part of both of their exits, um, first by private equity and then ultimately by Adobe where I spent nearly um, a little bit over four years. And then prior to that, at some small, fast startups, I really like the space in terms of like fast growing. Um, so my background is primarily, primarily leading revenue teams, um, usually in tech, right around the space of anywhere between like 500 employees and about 2,500 employees. Um, and work for companies like Webinato, Pros Pricing down in Houston, and, and that's ultimately my background. Awesome. Thank you, Nadia. And uh, a fun fact? Jeez. I'm actually not that, not that exciting compared to Anna in terms of like skydiving and stuff. I've had a couple of experiences where I thought I was going to do it and never made it there. Let's see, a fun fact. Um, this isn't that adventurous or fun, perhaps, but I recently had a baby and um, I'm on the road a ton with my teens and very often I take my baby with me, which is like probably a crazy fact, but not a fun one. That's amazing. That's, yeah, I was going to say that's arguably the, the craziest adventure you could do is have a, have a child for sure. That's awesome. And the, I think one of the scariest things, actually way scarier than that, is taking your baby on the road with you. <laughs> this whole separation anxiety I haven't got over just yet. <laughs> that's amazing. And I think we are joined by Patrick again. Hello, Patrick. Hi, Scott. Sorry for the audio difficulties. That's okay. It happens. Live webinars, you know. Um, but I was, so I was just saying, um, quick background um, and one fun fact. Sure. So I work at Altify and I lead the marketing alliances and business development organizations for Altify and we're in the business of what we call customer revenue optimization. So thrilled about this uh, discussion we're having today. In past lives, I've had both you know, sales leadership and marketing leadership roles at places like you know, Salesforce and Business Objects, as well as you know, startup and growth companies like Datasets. And in terms of uh, fun facts about me, amongst the trouble I've gotten myself into over the years is I've actually run with the bulls at Pomplona. Oh, nice. I think that just happened this week, if I'm not mistaken. You weren't running with the yeah. bulls this week, were you? <laughs> I, I was not. I, that was a few years ago um, when I was less likely to be injured. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Very cool. Well, I would love to dive further into that, but we'll take that offline. Um, so what I want to kick it off as, um, and this was something that a lot of executives have, have described their role and their job to me using the analogy of, well, basically, imagine you're in a plane and you're flying a million miles an hour and you're trying to build and improve the plane as you're speeding through the air. And so let's kick it off with, with that question. And I'll intentionally leave it, leave it vague. And Patrick, I'll start with you on this one. How do you keep the plane together and improve alignment and efficiency while you're speeding through the air 
500 miles per hour, your team is growing, the market is changing. Um, how do you keep it all together? Well, I think there's, there's two key elements. One is at the heart of your question, Scott, that fundamentally you need everybody on the team to have a bias for action. Uh, I was talking to you know somebody last week and he talked about uh, actually a, a friend of mine who runs a sales team at Salesforce and he talked about the do step, meaning particularly if your job is in sales or marketing and it's not your job and it's not somebody else's job, that means by definition it's your job particularly if you're in a revenue facing role. So you got to figure out how to make stuff happen. That's the first part of this. And the second part of this is you got to focus on the customer. I think a lot of times th th these things get disconnected because we all have different understandings of the customer and the customer is not something that happens at the bottom of your funnel. The customer is at the center of your business. So what the way to keep the plane moving in spite of all the moving parts, big and small happening and changes in marketing and competition is you've got to get everybody on the same page and surrounding the customer and shift the mindset from what are we trying to sell to what problem are we trying to solve and how do we get everybody on our team on this plane focused on the customer to help them drive to their outcomes. I love that. I love that. So having this bias for action and then making sure that, at the, the nucleus of everything that you're doing, the customer still lives there. And, and I know, you know, that's really the outreach identity uh, is, that, is that thought. So I would love your thoughts on the question as well of how to keep it all together as you're, as you're flying through the air. Well, it's hard. So that is, that's, that's be honest, it is hard. Um, we also be, believe in authenticity at, at outreach. But I, I, Patrick obviously said it incredibly well. I think it is, how do you keep the focus on what is the customer experience? And so when you're, I mean, obviously we all say it's communication, it's collaboration, and how do you make sure those things are happening? And you're also really understanding at all times what's the customer experience in that. It isn't just what we're doing, it's what do they feel and how, how are they seeing the company? And I think you know, just to take a tactical route to that, I think one of the things that's helping keep these, this discussion, these teams together as we go with this 500 miles an hour is the technologies that are now finally being developed for these go-to-market teams. You know, obviously I work at Outreach, so I'm a bias, but I will say there's a lot of technologies coming up that are really helping create that connective tissue between these go-to-market teams. So they're enabling us, like, how do you understand where you are in your efficiency and your effectiveness? And for the first time ever, we're pulling that process together and automating some of it and honing everything into a platform where people can sit and understand and see and move even faster. So that is, I think, something that is creating some of that kind of orchestration of the customer journey perspective that we haven't had before. And that is actually truly helping, I think, enabling that as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I would agree 100%. It's almost like technology has now given us this, this single pane of glass that we can all, we're all looking through the same window now, right? And there's this connectivity, but also this transparency where whether you're in sales, you're in marketing, or you're, you're in operations, you're looking at the same numbers and technology is aggregating all of that, that for you. Messaging, right? What is the messaging the customers are getting? So are yeah. we aligned? Right? Are we yeah. aligned on the team and how we're, are we meeting them where they are? Are we, you know, giving them the, the pieces of, is their experience, are we meeting them where their experience needs to be based on where they are in the customer journey? Those yeah. are all critical and technology is starting to really facilitate that. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And Nadia, anything to, to add on top of that? For sure. I'd echo everything that Patrick and Anna said. But, you know, for me, I think about, you know, what's driving revenue. That's my ultimate goal, right, in my mind, whether it's new revenue, add-on revenue, or customers renewing, all of that good stuff. Um, and so when I look at what are other things that we can be doing to drive efficiency and alignment? Those, those things are really important as well. So in my mind, I always break things up in that like urgent, important matrix that most of you are probably familiar with. And I'm like, what are things that we should be doing today that's going to impact us next quarter, next year? And so keeping that alignment on track and making sure that the right people are in the room where we're talking about how it's going to impact the longer term strategy. Um, and ensuring that we have the same KPIs, we're being measured in the same ways, and we're, we're driving toward that on a regular basis. So, you know, on a very tactical level, I even do things where, of course, I'm focused on revenue and all those activities and behaviors that come with that. But then I actually have days, like my Mondays and Fridays are like non-traveling days most of the time. And how do I make sure I'm doing things that drive the overall strategy versus just the day-to-day -day because we're so confused and, you know, just buried in that stuff often. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I love that strategy, keeping like Mondays and Fridays or at least a day a week to 
do that big picture thinking, uh, which can, can be difficult, I'm sure, in your role, getting pulled in 7 million uh, directions all the time. Um, all right, so this is super interesting. This is kind of how I wanted to frame up the conversation. I want to dive into to challenges here next, or what are the challenges that we're all facing? But before we do that, I think it would be really interesting before we get too much further into the meat of it is to do a quick poll. Um, I know we have a ton of people joining us today, and I would love to just understand their roles so we can kind of frame it a little bit better. Um, so why don't we take 30 seconds and we can put a poll up here. And I would love to know if you're an individual contributor at your organization, if you're a manager, or if you're up at that, you know, director level and above executive. And we'll give five, four, three, two, one, and we'll end the poll there. Okay. Interesting. So we got a pretty healthy mix. Um, basically kind of to be expected. This is almost an exact representation of the community. That's funny. Um, so we have 18% uh, is director level and above. So um, then we have 23% uh, coming from managers. And then we have 59% uh, that are individual uh, contributors. So assuming individuals that maybe have aspirations to, to become an executive one day. Okay, that's super helpful for myself anyway, as I'm kind of leading this conversation. So thank you, everyone. Um, okay, so I'll go, Nadia, to you first. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, you're facing right now uh, at Seismic or that your, the people you work with are, are mirroring back to you? Yeah, you know, I would say it run, and I would just say stepping back just outside of Seismic, right? We're selling a lot to like sales and marketers. So some of this comes from just observations of being out in the field. Yeah. I would say that when you think about it, you know, it's number one sales enablement. And we can talk a little bit more about that. I don't necessarily mean like the enablement when you have new salespeople joining the company. So we'll talk about that. And then also, I noticed that there's a lot of sellers spending time on what I call non-revenue tasks, right? I think I saw a stat somewhere where it was like roughly 59% of, I think the sellers spend time on non-selling activities. And so those are, you know, things I see across the board. Anytime I'm speaking to CROs or CSOs, they echo a lot of that as well. Um, so those are things that I, I often see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a big problem. You know, 59, 59% of non revenue driving activities that's and you look at that on a, a macro level across your entire organization that's a lot of wasted time um, so that's a huge issue for sure patrick what else are you seeing out in the market that kind of poses a challenge for revenue teams uh, well i think there's the three primary challenges that we encounter it's the same thing if you're a small growth company on the way up or you're you know, already somebody that has some scale, you know, think a, a Highland software or a Workday or a, you know, a Tableau, which is how do we get a better alignment around what's important to our customers? And how do we get not just, you know, the salesperson who might be the tip of the spear and, and sitting out in front of the customer, but how do we get the entire extended revenue team on the same page regarding what's important to the customer and what's our unique value to help them do what they're trying to get done? That's, that's number one. And then the next two are, you know, as old as time. Number one is, yeah, how do I build pipeline? And number two, how do I compete more effectively and drive sales velocity when the deals that matter? Because I've yet to meet any sales leader or any salesperson who thinks she's got too much pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as too much pipeline. There's just not enough sales reps. And, you know, more importantly, in the world we all live in, the data intensive, customer enabled customers, customer empowerment, um, focus that the whole world has and we all enjoy as consumers in a P2B context, that means you've got to be at the top of your game every single time to not only get through and be on the same wavelength with the customer and make those connections, but you have to have a clear differentiated value proposition or somebody else can and will, you know, beat you to, to winning the business for the customer. So those three things, I think all, all come together. And, and a lot of times, where the, the breakdowns are is we're not on the same page. We're not speaking the same language. Everyone's running like hell, but we're not getting the right outcomes because we're not all lined up around these three big areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm excited to get really tactical with some of the solutions 
for those problems. But before we get into that, Anna, I'd love to hear your uh, viewpoint on this as well. Our biggest challenges that you're seeing. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just, everything that, that Nadia and Patrick said, I absolutely, I totally agree. I think the other challenge is with the velocity that go-to-market teams are starting to move. And again, technology is also creating some of that, but that velocity is really hard to stay on top of. So, so Nadia's saying, how do you start to automate what doesn't need to be humans so they can focus on what does, which is how do you talk to your customers? So where do you spend the time to talk to them? And it's not about talking to them about what you're selling. It's what is it that you're solving, right? And I think we, we start moving so much too, we forget about that. What's the pain that we're solving for them, not the feature that we've, or the, our product that we've built. And we always, and no matter how long I stay in this career, I am always amazed. We always forget that we're so wrapped up in our own world and our own product. And we forget to go, by the way, you know, what is it that you're feeling as a customer? What is your experience and how do I help fix it with what we have? So. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree. So we, we covered a few things there and what I was hearing anyways. So enablement, number one. Uh, two is getting our teams to be on the same page, driving the same message home. Uh, two, how do we obviously create pipeline, then deal with sales velocity, and then lastly, making sure that we're focusing on solving versus selling. So I want to unpack kind of each one of those, and we'll start with this enablement piece. And Anna, I'll go, I'll go to you because this idea that sellers are spending less than half their time selling is a problem. So how do you approach that from the top down and start to give sellers time back so that they can actually sell? It's a great question. I think we've done a few things. Obviously, you know, again, that technology component is really starting to help here, but I think it takes care of a piece of that. And then how do you also then start to take a look at are there, t we've asked sellers often, too often, I think, go recreate the wheel. We've, we've told you here, you know, go create an account plan, go create, you know, this, your know, pipeline meeting, go create. And it's like, how do we start, especially as you think about an account plan, as you think about, obviously, some of what obviously we templatize is, you know, how, what are things you're saying? How do we do that? But how do we start to give some velocity to, let's give you the structure of it. We're going to do most of it for you. And here, you fill in these components of it, right? And you're mm -hmm. doing these so they're not recreating in their own way every single time you get consistency across the team, which is what obviously so many of these technologies are trying to create these teams, but is how do you start to, you know, outsource offshore templatize some of the things they're doing. So you're giving them the stepping stones. You're often asking, I think sellers also to go, okay, here, they're there, here, go target this account. There's, you can target the VPs of that account. There's 120 VPs of that account. Where do I start? Right. How do you start to, Really give them some of the basic foundations and the process to build that so that they're not doing it on their own because they are spending too much time working on that thinking about it how do you give them start to create templates like we've already put the information on the press release out from you know in there for you we've already put the information about you know what they said in their last 10 q in there for you so you read that understand it and now you add what is it you're customizing for that customer again how do you change their customer experience how do you understand their pain is the most important thing i think the education and obviously i know Nadia is also hitting on all the other things that we're asking you to do with updating Salesforce and all those sorts of things that are not actually truly selling. So mm -hmm. obviously there's enablement through the technologies and then there's the enablement through some of the things they still have to do to get to an account and understand who to target and who they should be talking to that I think we can also facilitate with some lower cost resources. And you, you think about some of the you know, data quality specialists and other people you have on your RevOps teams that can help build some of those templates and fill in some of that information you know, outsourcing or offshoring some of those things as well, where we're really pulling that in a velocity way to mm -hmm. have it at their tip so then they can do the final crafting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with everything you're saying there. And I think a really good exercise that I would urge anyone who's listening to this to do with their, their sales team is sit down with one of your top sellers and map out what all the activities are that aren't actually selling activities. And then you as a, a leader or a manager start looking for ways. Like you said, there's, uh, there's a lot of offshore opportunities that are much cheaper that can spend time making sure your data is, is up, to, up to par. There's, you know, I know at, at Outreach, we have people that will create templates and, you know, these great sequences. So the sellers, you know, have time 
to focus and actually when you automate things you actually have more time to personalize right that's the interesting thing you can actually spend more time personalizing when you don't have to worry about okay where is that case study or or what are we talking about this week so that's uh that's super interesting and patrick let's go to you and try and tackle a different problem here and that's uh one that you actually mentioned is staying on the same page uh, with what's important to your customers across all teams, as I'm sure your messaging is updating constantly. How do you think about tackling and solving that problem? Yeah, in, my, in our experience, Scott, and what we see across the, the customer base at Altify is when you talk to a really skilled sales leader, more often than not, they will put it in three buckets. There's the mindset bucket, the skill set bucket, and the tool set bucket. So if you're going to start to, to change behavior, the, the big shift, uh, the best way I've heard this talked about is Ed McQuiston, who's the chief commercial officer at, at Highland Software. He talks about the mind shift we want to move from is what's our strategy to the customer to what's the, stra what's the customer strategy for their customers and how do we help? And so if you can change the frame from what are we selling you know, this month, this year, to how do we align all the resources that we have inclusive of our best thinking to help the customers su succeed, then you start to break through the barrier from a transaction into a relationship and into a long-term value proposition that you can really help grow. The second piece of that is then the skill set bucket is nobody got up, particularly nobody with a revenue number got up today and tried to suck more or suck a little bit less than they did yesterday. And the problem, what we see commonly is, and I'm interested in, in Nadia's uh, perspective on this and Anna's perspective on this, is you don't have enough time to coach. The problem is I've got lots of data, but I don't know where to spend my most precious element, which is my time. And if you look at whether it's the U.S. women's soccer team or any other professional athletes you've ever seen, they work on nutrition and they work on exercise and their mindset and their sleep schedule. And they've got a whole variety of specialists versus those of us in the sales world are just trying to move faster and block and tackle. And oftentimes we don't get into a coaching dialogue with our manager, our manager's manager about what does good look like and how do I rethink the problem and how do I change behavior to help get to the right kind of outcomes? And last but not least, a little bit bridging off the, the last question is, is, you know, what does that look like in terms of tools? And I think capabilities like outreach where we're a happy customer or, you know, seismic where we've got great customers in common is how do you make it easier for the rep to get to the fundamental equation, which is I need more value out of the application than the data I put in. So how do you blend content and process and templates and best practices so a rep comes to any, any particular element in that sales process and already has a bunch of stuff pre-prepared for them so they can take what they know about the customer, the market, the situation, and get it rapidly into action mode. That was great. I, I'm literally sitting here taking notes. There was, there was a lot in there, and I love that framework of kind of mindset, skill set, and tool set. That's a, an easy framework to kind of break it down. Um, so... And Nadia, I want to go to you now and try and see if we can unpack and tackle the issue of getting your sales folks and your entire revenue team to be focused on solving versus just selling. How do you kind of approach that at Seismic? Did we lose Nadia? Ah, we, looks like we lost Nadia. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll open that one up. Uh, Anna or Patrick, whichever uh, one of you would like to tackle that one, um, making sure that we're solving versus selling. And not, more importantly, I think, not forgetting. I think we all know that we're supposed to be solving, but it, it can be hard when, like you said, Patrick, we're blocking and tackling all day long. Yeah, I'll start and then uh, and kick it back to Anna or to Nadia. But I think fundamentally anything that that looks like great selling, you can decompose very simply into people and problems. So number one, from a, from a problems perspective, you have to really understand, have some insight around the customer around what are their goals? What's important to them? And what are the outcomes they're trying to get to? No, what, what informs that? What are the pressures both inside the building as well as the external market, the competitors that are really driving what they're trying to get to? And then what does that look like in terms of initiatives and obstacles? You've got to be able to put together the story of the customer and get them involved so you're speaking the same language, their language. And that gets you the right kind of framework to drive the outcome you're, you're looking for. So that's the problem side. The people side is a little bit of the sales 101 problem, who's who in the zoo? 
how do you take you know, things like contact lists or reports to in Salesforce and turn it into a hierarchy that you can start to navigate and understand influence, who's important, who's in the inner circle, who's sponsoring your solution, who's a mentor to you and selling for you, as well as how do they buy and where do we stand with them? If you can't bring those two pieces together, then you're going to have a whole bunch of lost in translation and a lot of wasted cycles that don't look like the right kind of outcomes and the right kind of behaviors. That's great. Great insight. And Nadia, are you uh, on the line? Are you back? I'm back, yes. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, so the, the question, I would love to get your take on this too. Um, and Patrick had some great points, but it's this, this idea of always remembering and getting our revenue teams to remember that we're in the business of, of solving problems, not selling our solution. Um, how do you keep that always top of mind uh, across your revenue teams? Yeah, for sure. Great question. So for me, what I try to do is have salespeople remove any sort of what I call F and F feature functionality type of talk. Right. And so it's more so on like, let's listen to what the challenges are. Right. What sort of value are we actually providing and what are we solving for? So as a standard and a lot of my reps know this, right, it seems very tactical, but I want you to go into a discovery call and not talk anything about our platform, our solution set. And I want you to do a lot of learning and find out where, where are their pains or where can we actually impact their revenue, whatever it may be. And so I actually challenge them to not talk about future functionality. Um, so we can actually be much more cognizant that we're here to solve a challenge, right? And for us, like selling Seismic, Seismic is a great platform that we have, and I'm not trying to do a plug by any, any means, but a lot of times there's other competing projects, right? And so we need to figure out like what is the value that we're driving for the overall organization. And so we do a lot of work around like value consulting and value engineering to make sure that the salespeople themselves are thinking about it in the same way that an executive does when they look at a business case across the organization. Yeah, yeah. That's an awesome exercise and something as being having been an individual contributor in the past that was hammered into me to get get rid of the, the feature functionality. And I, I used to always, when I led BD teams in the past, I used to always try and frame it too with, I wanted the organization that I was talking to, to get as much value from me, like you said, value consulting, from me, the individual, as they would from the software or whatever it is, the product or service that I'm selling. But they would be comfortable like signing a check, like here you go, because that person that I just talked to was an expert in their field. And I learned so much about, you know, uh, industry X that that was worth it, whether or not we go forward with the product or service. Um, so a big proponent of this idea of kind of value consulting. Um, Anna, I'll flip the same question to you because I think this was one that you initially uh, brought up. Anything to add on top of, of what we've already discussed? No, I think we're, I'll, I'll be de beating a dead horse here in a second, but I <laughs> The well, fundamentals that you're are listening, right? We're talking about yeah. listening to your customer. Yeah. We all get so excited about what we want to say. You forget to be quiet for a minute. And I still remember I took a negotiation course at many, many years ago at Wharton. And one of the, this, I written this book, he was like, you just have to sit there and be quiet. If you can be quiet for the first 15 to 20 minutes of your discussion, you will learn more than you ever thought you would. And you know, obviously keep asking those open-ended questions. And those are fundamentals that we also, de again, forget. It's like, stop for a second. I still remember I was in this course and I remember going back upstairs to my room and I had a call with Google. And I sat there and I was like, it was killing me. And I sat there for 20 minutes and I did not say much except open-ended questions. And we sold a $3 million project in 30 minutes. And it was them talking, continuing to iterate. Well, my pain's really this. Well, actually, as I think about it, it's actually really this. And maybe you guys could help with this too. And it, he just kept going. And it was phenomenal. It was one of those moments where you're like, okay, this works. <laughs> you know, if I stop. <laughs> I actually listen because you don't know to, to Nadia and Patrick's points. You don't know what their pain is unless you're listening to what is happening to them. What is their process? And then you can start talking about your point. Well, what I've seen work is these sorts of things. These are what other customers have experienced, what you've experienced. Make them also feel not alone, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen that. You know what? You're not alone. This is a common problem. Let's tell you how we've other, seen others deal with that. And that's also, I think, a great way to make them feel it's relatable. This is something we see a lot. How do you then help them because of what we've seen before? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My, one of my old VPs always used to frame that to me. It's like, if, if you went to a doctor's office 
and you came in, you're like, here's what's wrong with me. And the doctor just started, oh, it could be this, could be this, could be this, could be this. And like over talking, you're going to get extremely nervous versus you go in, you're like, you know what? We see this all the time. Here's exactly how we help this person with the same, you know, illness or whatever. Um, and then you're going to feel calm and definitely listening more than you're speaking is, is huge. I think our, our friends over at Gong recently did a study that top sellers will talk 30% of the time and listen 70% of the time, which is, is amazing. Um, so that was awesome. And we could still keep tackling those challenges, but I don't want to uh, lose sight of really the, the alignment piece. And the next question I want to ask is, there may be people uh, listening to this who feel as if their teams are aligned. You know, maybe you have your, your, your weekly meeting with all your revenue teams and you're feeling fairly aligned. What's, what's the next iteration of that? Once you have decent communication across uh, the, the organization and, and you're going towards the North Star, what's the next iteration of alignment? And uh, Anna, let's go back to you on this one. You know, I'm going to do something tactical for a second because we a lot of us think we have alignment, right? Just like, you know, we've got communication, meetings are good, productive, we've got our action items, teams are talking. And I'm, I think take one thing I've seen that I feel like really helps improve alignment is take the cross-functional team that touches the customer in their customer journey and let's take a customer that's closed, you know, say six months ago or whatever, and walk through what, what did, how many touch points did they have with our organization? Who did they touch? What message did they get? You know, how did we touch them? What channels did we touch them through? And say, what experience did they have? What was the customer experience going through our customer? What did we do? And is that a good experience? Do you feel like as, you know, as a cross-functional team, you said, we're aligned. The reason we need alignment is because you think you're creating a great customer experience from that alignment. And so walk it through. Go see, are you really doing that as you, as you sit on the other side of that table and say, okay, what are the experiences they're walking through your process? And so are we as aligned as we think we are? And I think it's just one way to just sanity check yourself going, no, I love the way we did that message or I, I, we really took a lot of the touch points out. So we're really refining that process and making it easier for them to work with us, right? That is really the goal. And so I think just taking a tactile step of, of walking it through, get some empathy for your customer and walk through their experience with you and your team. That's a fantastic exercise, and you're you're totally right because you could feel internally. You could feel, hey, we're totally aligned. We're high fiving. We have three meetings a week. You know, this is awesome. We're all great friends. But on the other side, if you're making your customer follow your internal journey because it it makes you feel aligned internally, but it's not a nice buying experience for them, then you have all sorts of alignment on on a different scale, alignment between you and the, the customer versus internal alignment, which is worse. Yeah. yeah, and Scott, I'll add, a lot of times companies, they do a lot of like loss reviews, right, post-sale. Um, mm -hmm. But oftentimes I see more and more companies doing a lot of win reviews. And that's a great time to get some feedback in terms of like, from a customer's view, what was that buyer's journey like, right? Like when you think about the handoffs from each team, whether it was marketing to sales and customer success, whatever it may be, and get their feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Patrick, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I have a bunch. And I, and I, but I think that building on, the, on Nadia's point and, and Anna's point, I think that, that what's the next step or a tactical next step to help take it to the next level is I would ask the folks on the on the webinar or I would whether you're a single contributor or you happen to be running teams is when's the last time somebody not in sales was part of a opportunity review or an account plan review uh, because more often than not what you find is and, and this happens particularly the world over there's always some notion of a quarterly business review where you fly in all the sales people and all the revenue people and then those devolve into you know, opportunity reviews instead of account plan and longer term strategy reviews. And it's primarily sales and then their food chain going up to senior executives. And one of the things that we see consistently about how do you take this to the next step or how do you get in front of this so it's not a diagnostic after the fact is bring customer success, bring the business development team, for sure bring the marketing people, as well as, you know, finance and ops, 
bring those people into an opportunity or an account plan review and really talk deeply about what's going on with the customer and the market situation, et cetera. You'll unearth the best thinking across the entirety of the team and you'll take all these other people who may not have direct customer contact and get them personally invested in what are we trying to do and why is it important? And what is the customer trying to do and, and why is what we do so important to helping them get where they go? That changes, that's part of how you change the entire organizational mindset, but it's also part of how you really bring to life this idea of, you know, revenue ops or, or alignment is not just an esoteric concept. It is a set of behaviors that you want everybody to exhibit every day that's going to turn into close one business, long-term relationships, and, and really meaningful, you know, predictable growth outcomes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I want to dive, let's dive into that, like very tactically, um, Patrick, back at you, how do you empower and motivate people who are, who are maybe not completely tied to that deal, right? Like salespeople, it's easy to understand the value right away, right? You're like, okay, if I learn something from this deal, this win-loss review, well, maybe I can apply it to my next deal. And, you know, there we go. There's my value. How are you empowering people across other business functions to be just as excited to dive into that review? Well, I think there's a couple elements of that. One is, uh, number one is ask. You would be astonished by how many people, and, and I'm actually surprised as, as a recovering sales leader who now runs an art marketing organization, how many times I run into marketing people who have never spent any time with the sales team, much less been out in front of the customer. And more often than not, when you ask, people are waiting to be asked. People, because they know that in most companies have some variation of a culture, the net of which is the superstars are the sales leaders and the sales teams. There's always the team that closed the big deal. And most of those people have revenue numbers and they get paid a lot. And there's a reason for that. That job is really hard. And, and arguably the hardest job is frontline sales leader, but that's a whole nother webinar. But the, the reality, the first thing you do is invite them to the party because people want to feel like they're important. They want to connect with what the company deems to be important. And everyone wants to believe they have something unique to contribute. That's part one. Part two is get them connected to an account plan. The problem that we see in real life is the best sales leaders and the best salespeople the world over do account planning, and it's part of the cadence of how they run their week and their month and their quarter. Everybody else who is less than uh, world-class, it's the type of thing that's done in a spreadsheet under threat of beating or worse at the beginning of the year. It goes in Excel, it goes in a drawer, and it's never seen again. And that is a recipe to suboptimize everybody, starting with the customer and the valuable cycles you spend with them. And then the third piece of the puzzle is the account plan has to be actionable if you pick up that construct. There's got to be objectives and owners and timelines that cross the entire team that everybody can get into and understand their unique piece in helping drive the relationship and drive the outcome for the customers forward. So when account planning becomes not a nice to have, it becomes, you know, the operational muscle that you have that includes the entire extended revenue team. That's where you get, that's where the magic happens. That's where you get the right kind of outcomes. And there's nothing more exciting than seeing a culture of, everybody's in sales, everybody's connected to the customer and everybody's looking to generate an outcome. That's where the magic happens. I love it. I love it. So let's, let's continue down this thread of really tactical tips. And we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, and we always like to leave with, you know, some things that people can walk away and implement tomorrow. And we've had some great ones already. Um, but Anna, I know this culture of, of winning together permeates, you know, outreach. So, from your experience, what are some super tactical tips that someone could implement tomorrow that will improve alignment throughout your org, even if it's incrementally? Yeah, I mean, I think this, that walking the customer journey is definitely one that we just talked mm-hmm. about a moment ago. Yeah. But I think, you know, another one, in fact, we were just doing this this morning. We said, we're just taking a step back and we're looking at our team and we, we cross-functional. So it's SDRs and AEs and marketing and BI. So we actually pull all that together and we say, Let's look at health metrics and velocity. So is the business healthy? And then what are the levers we have for velocity? So you do a quick check just to get everybody aligned. Are we at the place we should be? Is our pipeline looking good? Is the, you know, where we should we be at this quarter, this month? All those things are said, are, what are the health metrics? And then what are the levers we have for velocity? And then we have the sales development team. We've got marketing. We've got all these things that we say, well, how do we increase velocity? Spiffs, those sorts of things and say, which of those things do we really need? hit on is the health okay so then how do we talk about velocity what levers we pull and so i really love looking at just those two pieces of the business sometimes it really simplifies and what we did we take this all the way down to taking a look at reps across and say what is their health 
as an as a individual rep and what is the velocity? How do we help them as a team cross-functionally? How do we help that team, that team member of ours, one of the AEs in the field, do a better job because they're having, they're struggling. Looks like numbers are off. So health is bad. So what, what levers do we use on the velocity side to help them get better? And we do mm -hmm. it as a cross-functional team. And then we go to that team and say, hey, we're going to show you all the things we think we can do to help you. And so you now you've got our team behind you. You create amazing alignment when you start empathizing with what's happening every day in the field with a cross-functional team to say, how does each of them help them be more successful? Because it, it yeah. makes the team more successful. Yeah. I love that. So first, looking on a, a macro level of health and velocity, if it's healthy, how do we you know, speed up the iterations? And then on a, a micro level, on an individual basis, how do we help each individual rep or whoever, you know, do their job better and, and more efficiently? I like yeah. it. Yeah, seeing something going sideways, that team is all the ones who can help you have everybody in the room, right? Yeah, totally. And uh, Nadia, I'll, I'll do the same, same question. And in case you missed it, it was, what are some really tactical tips um, that you can implement tomorrow uh, that would help someone listening to this webinar uh, with alignment throughout their organization. For sure, and apologies if I'm being repetitive, I was kicked off, but you know, for me, it's about getting on a regular cadence, right, with your internal stakeholders and your peers. And I think it goes further than just like the leadership team, right? So of course, you're gonna have the head of customer success, sales, marketing, revenue ops, et cetera. But I like to go down and actually create a committee of stakeholders, right? So think about the individual contributors and get them on a specific sort of committee where they're gathering the feedback and we're trying to work much more closely together because they're the ones that go through it day to day. And so that's something just, it goes further than just let's get the leaders in the room, right? So that's what I would focus a lot on. Absolutely. And yeah, it mirrors kind of what, what Anna was, was saying about, you know, getting the entire organization just behind one person because that's sometimes what it takes. And, you know, having been there, you know, as, as a seller before, there's nothing, there's no more powerful feeling in the world when you, you figure out that, wow, I'm not out here alone doing this. It can, it, sales can be a lonely job. And then you kind of have this realization, you're like, hold on, I'm actually the quarterback here. I'm not, I'm not the person who is, you know, just blocking and tackling all day. I have all of these resources and all of these people at my disposal. And I think that's what, Patrick, to your point, what, what separates the amazing and the one percenters sellers uh, versus everyone else is that realization. And you can actually empower people as leaders to have that realization, which I think is, is really cool. Um, well, well, well the, other, the other comment on that, Scott, kind of going yeah. back to the, the folks on the phone who are single contributors, and your, your question about empowerment, I think if you flip the question around, it's on everybody to figure out what they can do to help. There's nothing that gets a leader's attention more than somebody on their team or from some other team approaching them and saying, how can I help you with the customer? How can I help you with the problem? What else do you need? Is there, what can I do? Or have you thought about, or what about this? Or come forward with good ideas, having that bias for action. That yeah. if you sit and wait to be asked, then you're, you're playing off your back foot as opposed to, you know, provide some value, lean forward, just lean in and make yourself available because I'm sure Anna and Nadia have the same problem I have, which is, you know, lots of things to do and not enough resources to do them. So we're looking to draft any and all, you know, smart people who have good intentions and are willing to work the problem. Totally. Absolutely. Goes full circle back to the, the bias for action where, where we started. Um, okay, so I have one more question, and I'm going to shut up because we got some excellent <laughs> questions from the community that I want to get to. Um, but I don't think that we can have a full discussion on alignment without talking a little bit about revenue operations. Uh, I think it's a somewhat new concept, um, at least in, in SaaS. It seems to be much more prevalent these days. More people are talking about it. And again, this could be a whole other webinar, but there's clearly this big movement towards RevOps right now. And I would just love uh, each of your thoughts about RevOps and what you see the main function of RevOps uh, being. And Anna, I'll, I'll start with you. I think your, your theme of alignment and RevOps is, is exactly the right one, right? It is really mm -hmm. trying to say again, with all the teams that are in, in the customer journey, how do we create an operations function that's supporting them all? So you're getting that data passed through, you're getting that understanding, you're getting a single source of truth 
literally across the company for the customer journey and, and what that's looking like and how those teams are performing. And I think it's really this, it's owning the operations, the strategy and the enablement from my perspective of the customer journey. All those teams that are sitting in front of customers, whether they're customer success or their renewal or their implementation teams, their marketing, their, their obviously the sales teams, is you have a revenue operations teams that's supporting them all. So again, mm -hmm. you're getting that single pane of glass a bit from the operations side of how do we support and help where again, on health and velocity as you're looking at each of those teams, you start to then get a much more efficient and effective way to look at it. it's not in silos anymore. Yeah, totally. And Nadia, I'll go to you, uh, same question. Your view on, on RevOps and the, the function. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's such a critical part of the business, right? And I think of RevOps as any go-to-market team, right? Um, so echoing exactly what Anna had said. Um, it's interesting because all of the groups tend to operate in silos, right? So how do you bring everything together in silos in terms of like different processes, not aligned KPIs, different tools. And so it's a very critical part of the business, right? Especially if you have these teams better aligned, it impacts revenue and, you know, the overall lifetime value of the customer goes up. There's so many positive attributes of it. And a lot of times people tend to have sales ops and kind of use revenue ops interchangeably, but I actually think it's very different, right? So focusing on the broader set of teams that do support the overall go-to-market strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree. I think they're two different functions. And I think the, the importance of rev ops is almost like the, the unbiased of it all. Right, they're just overseeing it all. They're not like in one certain lane. They're not in the marketing lane or the sales lane. They're kind of overseeing. Uh, Patrick, anything to to add for RevOps? Yeah, I'd say RevOps is a natural outcome of this whole move towards customer revenue optimization and trying to figure out how do you drive the customer outcome and how do you bring methodology and process and strategy together to drive the right kind of outcome because the problem we all have is we're caught in our silo or in our function and we don't understand the customer in the same way and we don't score the same way. If I'm in business development or I'm in marketing, you know, I tend to talk about customers as a lead score or you know, a pipeline stage. If I'm in sales, I tend to look at, look at what's the product mix and, and really you know, what's my forecast number. Or if I'm in finance, I'm an AOV number. And if I'm in customer success, you know, I'm an NPS number. None of those things actually tell me what's important to the customer or organize all the behavior across those silos in a way that you drive the right kind of outcome. So to me, RevOps is some combination of, of traffic control and solving the lost in translation problem. So we all get on the same page about what is the outcome? What are the resources we're going to bring to bear to help our customers drive that? And I think that this is something that's still early days because a lot of customers that we see and a lot of prospects that we see the broader market love the idea, but the actual operating cadence and the process and structures don't match. So I think we're early days on something that's going to become critically important when we think about, you know, what, what, what the next five years look like for customer revenue optimization. Absolutely. And I love that, uh, analogy of traffic control. Uh, it's very much uh, what I feel the RevOps function kind of exists to do. Um, all right, so I wanna go to the community. We've got some great questions, so thank you everyone for, for the engagement throughout. Um, and the first one, I really like this question. This is from uh, Dan uh, over at Vendor Neutral. Dan, thank you for the question. Uh, this is, so how do you define what is important when you are responsible for moving the ball forward and those looking to you for direction all feel that their initiatives are the most crucial to your organization's forward progress and success. So everyone thinks they have the answer. They're all pitching it to you. It is 100% the right way to go. How, how do you navigate that? And uh, Anna, I'll go with you first on this one. Um, I think just fundamentally, and this is obviously the, we all deal with this all the time. I see Patrick laughing. I was like, <laughs> everybody's, everybody's initiative is the most important one. Um, but honestly, you know, and this is one of our jobs, and obviously as a COO, this is what I do half the time. I am the traffic controller for half of that stuff, but it is, mm -hmm. I need to prioritize what impacts our customers. What's the biggest ROI to our customers and to our company. And I have to prioritize that way. And typically th those two things go together. So when I say, when I'm looking at all the things we could do, and there's always the, the ability to say no is the hardest thing, 
right? There's lots of things you can say yes to and then you peanut butter yourself and you never actually execute on them well. You have to focus. You say of the things that are on the table, what things can we execute on the best and what gives the best advantage and ROI to our customers? And those are then the things that make it to the top of the list. So in a simplistic way, that is, that is always the way to choose. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like that way of like thinking, if you are saying yes to frequently, it's all the yeses will be half-baked versus if you say no, then the yeses will be that much more impactful and you can actually do them right. So I really like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Nadia, I'll go with you on this one as well. Um, how do you, I guess it's a, it's a question of prioritization uh, amongst all the different things that everyone is trying to do that's going to be, you know, the, the silver bullet for your organization. Yeah, I think it's really understanding and having them understand, right, what's the biggest ROI here for our customers, for our revenue, and thinking about it through that lens, right? Sometimes we look at goals that, you know, just more efficiency or whatever it may be, but I think about what's going to have the biggest bang for whether it's the investment or the time. And so thinking about it like that and then getting everyone behind what you think makes the most sense. And it doesn't mean that we're going to do it we're not going to do it now, um, but it's something that we could certainly think about and prioritize down the road. But I think it's also having them being bought into your vision and your vision of growth and, and reaching that specific milestone or target. Yeah, totally. Vision is so unbelievably important and shared vision even more so. Um, okay, I, I want to go to, we've got two other questions. And Patrick, I'm going to start with you. And this is uh, from Anna Davis, uh, the, the biz dev manager at GoFable. Um, what controls and measures, and this is playing off our pain, uh, plane analogy, what controls and measures do you put in place if and when the plane starts nosediving? Bit of a, a negative question, but you know, it's, it's, it's a possibility. Well, you know, I think the, the thing you want to get to right away is, is what is the, the core symptom of, of the underlying cause? It's really easy to have tactical fixes to problems, whether it's we're not selling enough, or we're not getting enough upsell, we're not doing this, that, or the other thing. More often than not, the, the danger there is that you address the, the symptom and you don't get to the underlying cause. And a great example that we see time and time again is something like forecast accuracy, where the rubber meets the road if the plane starts to it is not in the flight plan anymore, it starts to veer off, you can right away look at forecast accuracy. And more often than not, it gets, if you're not paying close enough attention, you have some version of, uh, well, we just need more rigor from our sales leaders. And I have yet, I don't know too many sales leaders who've had any tenure who aren't pretty good at forecasting. The, the fundamental issue underneath the covers, more often than not, is qualification. You see deals slip or forecast accuracy because salespeople are, are spending too much time sitting on deals they shouldn't be sitting on. And the bottom line is they weren't properly qualified. They should have been qualified out early because, you know, you can't compete, you can't win, you don't have a unique value proposition, or there's no compelling event. So it's, it's spending the time to, you know, not panic and to get the team around and really dive into the problem to get to the underlying issues, which oftentimes net out the, you know, process and methodology. Do we really understand what's going on? Do we understand our unique value, our unique, uh, you know, the approach we're taking to customers and are we really being rigorous on the basics to qualify in and qualify out because all problems get solved with more sales. And, and so if you can start there and, and just have an honest conversation and you can get into a lot of things to, to course correct, you know, pretty quickly, that's going to help drive sales velocity and get the plane back moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I love that. Great advice. So don't go with the, the quick pill or the quick band-aid just to fix the symptom that's happening. You have to really dive deep and find that, that root cause uh, of everything or else it's just going to keep, keep happening. Um, awesome. Okay. Last question uh, here and then we'll wrap up. Um, so this is Lucas Walker from, from Jay Barrows Consulting. I know he runs marketing over there. Um, this is a, a personal question and Nadia, I'll start with you. How do you deal with the stress of having so many people depend on your performance? Yeah, and I wouldn't categorize it as stress, right? I think that you're either wired for it or you're not. It actually, it's, it's a big rush for me. Um, I think at the end of the day, as long as you're doing all of the right activities and behaviors, 
you're going to get to the end goal, right? You're going to have some good times, not so good, so many good times, but ultimately it's making sure that you're doing the right things day to day to go to a positive outcome. So I don't necessarily look at it as stress, right? We're in a team environment, even though I'm responsible for that team number, it's still a team environment. And so um, I'm not taking on all of the accountability, right? In sales, a lot of people are what I say, their own CEO, and there's a lot of accountability on an individual basis as well. Um, so that's sort of my outlook on it. I love it. Well, that is our time. I could sit here and, and speak with you all for, for hours um, and pick your brains, uh, but uh, I know you all have busy schedules. Um, but I wanted to say thank you, uh, Anna, Patrick, uh, Nadia. This has been an awesome conversation. We had some amazing engagement throughout, so I know the community uh, appreciates it, and thank you all for your time.